So I want to thank uh, everyone who has uh, taken the time to join us for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm always happy to share my experience when it comes to giraffe conservation and raising awareness. Uh, and that's because giraffe are one of those species that have been uh, not studied as much as the other charismatic species. And so any chance I get to talk about giraffe, I'm always excited. Um, so to put this in context, uh, why do I actually care about giraffe? Uh, so well, I care about giraffe because uh, they are one of the most charismatic species uh, in Africa. Uh, they are found in 21 countries uh, across Africa. Uh, but then what many people don't know is that actually there are four species of giraffe instead of one species and nine subspecies. Uh, and because they are found across this uh, huge, swatch of, huge swath of African countries, they face different threats. And you can see that actually over the past 30 years, uh, giraffe have gone locally extinct in seven different African countries. So that's the red shaded lines that you're seeing there. Uh, actually, as of now, uh, Niger is the only African country that has giraffe in the whole of West Africa. So that is, let me see if I can point it, that's only this side here that you are seeing. And so really giraffe have, are facing many threats. And so that's why for us, uh, saving giraffe is uh, uh, our main mission. And so uh, it's good to look at a map and say, oh, giraffe are found in 21 different African countries. But then also that means that giraffe are found in many different ecosystems. So we have the desert dwelling giraffe uh, in uh, Namibia and uh, parts of Angola. You have giraffe that are found in open woodlands. This is what many people assume that we can find giraffe uh, when you think of the wooded ha habitats where you have the savannas. So this is from um, Kidepo Valley National Park in North, uh, I think that's Northern Uganda. And then there are giraffe also that occur in like much more wooded areas. This is in Eastern Machison Falls in Uganda. And then you have giraffe that occur in peri-urban areas. Uh, I'm sure Neti misses this photo. This is from Nairobi National Park uh, here in Kenya. Uh, and so we have Nairobi National Park, which is a park that is surrounded by uh, very large infrastructural developments, but giraffe are one of those keystone species uh, in the park. And so giraffe really are one of those species that are interesting to study from a spatial ecology point of view. So what do I mean by that? Uh, giraffe face many, many varied threats because of the different areas where they occur. One of the biggest one is actually habitat loss and land fragmentation. So this is actually one of the main threats that uh, are pushing giraffes towards extinction. So this photo is from Hell's Gate National Park. And Hell's Gate National Park is known for being one of those parks that has geothermal energy. Uh, just like Nairobi National Park, it's close to uh, it's close to large urban areas, uh, and so that's this type of photo. But also, Hellsgate National Park is widely known for being uh, like the reference point that Disney producers used when they were producing uh, uh, The Lion King. So the scene where Mufasa, well, it's Scar actually, the scene where Scar pushes Mufasa off the cliff, that was modeled after Hellsgate National Park. So quite an interesting uh, habitat, but also that showcases the threats that giraffe are facing. Uh, we then have uh, snaring and poaching. And so when I talk about this topic, I usually like to separate the two because when I talk about snaring, I'm referring to instances where giraffe are being actively, uh, well, not actively, where, where rather actually people are going to a park, they set snares, uh, they are hoping to catch like a small antelope, a small animal that they can just put on their back, carry home and eat, which is something that happens. That's a reality that we must uh, accept, it happens. Uh, but then when you're hoping to catch like a small dick tick that weighs less than 30 kilograms, it can trap anything ranging to a giraffe, which weighs over 800 kilograms. And that's an animal that you cannot just simply put on your back and take home to cook. Uh, so that's a, a big challenge. Then poaching is a separate one because poaching here, we are referring to instances where people are actually going into the landscape, actively looking for that target animal. And so giraffe are actually pretty interesting because they are one of the few animals where any part of the giraffe can be used for something depending on where you are. So by this, I mean, the skin is used by some cultures to make, uh, to carry water, uh, the skull and meat, uh, well, the skull and bone marrow and brains are believed incorrectly to cure HIV and AIDS. Uh, there are some places where they hunt the giraffe just for the tail because it's a sign of power and the fly, uh, the tail hair makes actually very nice 
uh, bracelets. I say nice because I've never seen them, but that's what many people describe them as. And then, of course, this is a big animal. It can provide a lot of meat for people. So as you can see, any part of the giraffe can be used for anyone by uh, for different uses, depending on where you are. Uh, and of course, there is also the lack of long-term research and monitoring efforts. Uh, a good example here in Kenya, elephants, for instance, have been studied uh, continuously uh, for more than 60 years. That is a long time. There's a lot of data. But for giraffe, we are still learning. There's still a lot that we don't know. We don't know how giraffe communicate. We don't know how they find each other. All these are questions that we still can't answer. We've just recently found out that there are four species of giraffe instead of one. And all this is happening within the last five to 10 years, which is quite exciting and why I love the job that I have because there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's also predation. Uh, this is something that as a giraffe ecologist, of course, I must accept that it happens. Lions must eat. Uh, so, but when it comes to giraffe, adult giraffe do not have uh, predators that can take them down. Uh, but uh, except for lions, which are you know quite unique when it comes to cats, uh, because they are social cats and they can be able to take down adult uh, giraffe. But also, uh, lions account for about 75% of giraffe calf mortality. So there are important predators for giraffe. And then lastly, we have an emerging threat, which is disease. Uh, as I mentioned, with, when it comes to giraffe, we are still learning things. So a lot of my earlier work started actually was focused on disease. And so giraffe, just like other animals, are susceptible to like the common diseases that we know of, like rinderpest and anthrax. These are diseases that we know of and we know how we can manage them. But then when it comes to uh, giraffe specifically, there are some diseases that are unique to giraffe and we don't know how to uh, manage them. So this is the case with giraffe skin disease. You can tell by the very creative name, giraffe skin disease. Well, that's because it affects the skin, but it manifests as uh, lesions, uh, mainly on the legs. So if you link that to the point that I've just covered, if you see a giraffe with lesions on the legs, then obviously the most immediate concern that comes to mind is, does this affect movement? Does this enhance the capability of lions to take down giraffe? So that's part of what, of what I did for my uh, master's and PhD. The short answer is that individuals with mild and moderate forms of giraffe skin disease uh, are actually able to escape from lions. But individuals that have severe forms of the disease, those ones might become more easier target, uh, they become easier targets for lions. So with all these threats uh, in mind, uh, the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, we came up with what we are calling the Trigger Tracker Initiative. And so this was based on the, on the idea of using modern technology to then monitor the movement of, of giraffe. And this can be used to study different aspects, uh, be it to see, uh, to look at the impacts of diseases, to look at the impacts of infrastructure, all of those things put together that I've just mentioned, because technology can play a role in informing research and also in informing uh, management. So we are here to learn how do I fit a collar? Well, the first thing to do is actually to look at what technology is already there. So when it comes to monitoring giraffe, uh, one of the first tools that were used was an elephant collar, because if there's already technology there, why try to reinvent the wheel? So this is the African wildlife tracking uh, collar. It was, an, it was a modified elephant collar, because as I mentioned, the elephant had been studied for a very long time. And so there was already technology in use. So we thought, yeah, one is a big animal. The other is also a big animal. Let's try that collar and see what comes out of it. But then, obviously, these are different animals. So if you if if there are people here who've worked with elephant, they know that there's a counterweight here, and that actually makes that the collar should be uh, stabilizes the collar. But then giraffes are not pachyderms as elephants are. So this movement of that counterweight actually started to cause. Um, wounds on the giraffe, so this one will not use. Also, many of the giraffe, when they were bending down to drink, the unit just fell out. So obviously that was one of the challenges that had uh, the, that showed that this type of collar could not be used. So we then tried something different, uh, the head harness. Uh, this uh, looks like, uh, again, bringing more memories for Neti to Miss Home, this looks like a Samburu head harness. For those who have been to Kenya, I'm sure you've seen those head harnesses. Um, and so this is, uh, was designed in South Africa. 
Uh, it worked really well for those giraffes that are found in South Africa, the Southern giraffe. Uh, and that's because for them, they have a very small median ossicon. Uh, that's this part here compared to those giraffes that are found in East Africa. I'm sure for those who've traveled to East Africa and you've seen like male Maasai giraffe or male Nubian giraffe, you've seen that they have a large median ossicon. So this is even like a female reticulated giraffe. And you can see that this part here is actually very large compared to these other ones. So this uh, head harness, uh, it works really well uh, for South Africa, but then in East Africa, it can't work because of the positioning of the tracking unit that is here. So that's the tracking component. So obviously because of the, uh, the difference of the size of the skull, that meant that this tracking uh, type of technology could also not be used. So we then have what we are calling the Savannah Tracking OC unit. Uh, we call it the OC unit because it's, it needs to be fixed on the ossicon of the giraffe. So many people think that giraffe have horns. Uh, They're actually called ossicons. So that's why we call it the OC unit. So obviously this was a very uh, groundbreaking idea uh, because then the unit could stay on. Uh, it was uh, located on the head of the giraffe where there was very little impediment in terms of transmitting to satellites. So it can't, uh, there's very minimal of, of the signal. But then uh, if we think of the behavior of male giraffe, this actually uh, presented some challenges. So male giraffe, when they want to show dominance, they fight using their necks and they hit each other with the ossicons. So this, this type of units, we uh, only use them for male giraffe for a very short while because they kept on falling off. So we then moved to only using these types of unit for, for female giraffe. So this is quite an invasive type of uh, attaching of the unit. Uh, and that's because to attach it, you have to drill through the ossicon and attach uh, using surgical bolts. Uh, and so when I say drill, obviously I know it sounds very uh, intrusive, but for giraffe, uh, they don't have a lot of uh, veins and also nerves in that, uh, in the ossicon. So when we were actually drilling through the ossicon, there was very minimal reaction from the giraffe. So it was just drill, there was no sensation. But if someone would like try to touch the ear of a giraffe to when collecting DNA samples, you'll see that the giraffe would react because they, they feel pain, obviously. But this one, they didn't, they didn't feel pain and that was good for us. But obviously the motivation to move from this technology was because you could not track So then what are the latest and greatest technologies that we are using? So there is the Savannah tracking tail unit. So it's simply a modification of that OC unit. Uh, it was made smaller and then it was made a bit more convex or concave, whichever applies, I think it's convex. Uh, and then it was then made a much more lighter to be attached on the tail. And then you can see that here, there is a slant where the solar panel faces up and so it can still charge uh, uh, they can still charge facing up. Uh, and so this is the, the current version of the Savannah tracking units that we are using. Uh, there is also the uh, African wildlife tracking tail unit. So it's similar to this one, but this is a GSM version. So it's still uh, another alternative that is there, uh, but only can use GSM technology. And then there is series tags. Uh, and these are tags that were made initially to monitor cattle. Uh, in Australia. So because these are very light, also solar charged units, we said, why not trial them on giraffe? And they have been working really well uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, we think that it could be due to the positioning of the satellites, because in East Africa, we've seen that uh, they're not transmitting that well, but at least there's that's one of the options. So they can be fitted either on the tail or on the ears. So this is the same unit. So why this difference in technologies? Well, these different technologies also have answered different questions, to put it simply. So the Savannah tracking unit, this is a satellite tracking unit. Uh, it works with Iridium, and it's what you'd want to use if you are, if you want to collect fine scale data. So it can be programmed to collect points every 10 minutes, and then it will transmit, uh, the. it will upload the data to satellite every six hours. Whereas the series tags are much more for just looking at general movement because they collect points every four hours. So that's not going to give you fine scale data. This is just when you want to see where they've been, where the giraffe were going. So 
those are the different types of technologies, but then how do you actually fit it? So fitting a unit on a giraffe is not a trivial matter. It's not something you just wake up and say, hey, I want to tag 20 giraffe and you're going to do it. And that's because giraffes are very sensitive animals. They have a very unique anatomy. And so when it comes to handling giraffes, you need a qualified professional. Number one, that's because actually bringing down a giraffe requires uh, a specific and maybe, let me say, an accurate mixture of drugs to bring them down. So unlike, <coughs> sorry, unlike other larger animals, uh, we you don't use a lot of drugs to bring them down. So like an elephant, you'd want it to sleep throughout the whole procedure. But for giraffe, you, do, you because of the long neck and long legs, you don't want to affect its blood pressure. So you need a very qualified vet who can know just the right type of ratio of drugs to bring it down. And that means that you, when it's darted, you need to leave it uh, for a while to feel the effects of the drugs. And then you need a good roping team to gently, to gently uh, rope it to the ground so that you can then start your work. And that's because that's the standard and accepted procedure because giraffes have this long neck, long legs, uh, their, sense, their blood pressure can vary quite quickly. So you'd want a team that can actually move in very fast to, to bring down the animal. So when I say that, this is what this looks like. I hope everyone can see the video. If there is a lag, it's a video of a roping team bringing down a giraffe. So that's what it looks like. And then you need someone to come in quickly, hold the head down, because we don't use a lot of drugs to keep the animal down. It's just enough to, to make the animal feel woozy. And then you have a roping team to bring it down. And then the next step is there needs to be a vet to come in and immediately reverse the, the drug. So when I mean reverse is, I mean, wake up the animal. So if by some miracle, my presentation gives you enough confidence and knowledge for you to fit a tracking unit on a giraffe, what you need to know is that when you're fitting on the unit on the giraffe, the animal is fully awake and fully aware because the vet will have then reversed the drugs. So like in this instance, when you are collecting samples from the legs of the giraffe, when you're fitting units in Tanzania, this giraffe was fully awake. And so that's why there are ropes around the legs because we're trying to collect samples of giraffe skin disease. And so we needed some, we needed the legs to be held down so that it doesn't kick. It's fully awake. There are people holding down the neck. That's the accepted procedure. And so then once you have your units set in and the units are attached to you on the animal, what can you do with? So there are uh, various uses. Uh, we've used these units uh, to look at uh, management applications. So in this instance, we uh, the units are able to transmit immobility alerts. So by this, we mean that uh, when an animal is uh, has stopped moving, that can mean that there's been an poaching instance. So then that can then give uh, uh, like the uh, protected area managers in some information that there's something wrong there. Please go check it out. And so that's that's one of the use. There's also geofence alerts. Uh, in this case, we'd want to monitor giraffe and where they are going. So this was particularly useful uh, in uh, Northern Uganda. There is a park called Kidepo Valley National Park. And so the park managers here were concerned that when giraffes go to, uh, to South Sudan, so this park actually borders Uganda and South Sudan, uh, that they'd be at more risk of poaching. So a geofence alert simply means that if an animal approaches a certain area, it will give off an alert and then you can go and either push it back or just have some management actions where you know that when it reaches a certain area, you will get an alert and then you'll do, uh, you can uh, put in some measures to make sure that the animals don't uh, cross that boundary that you've set. Uh, there's also then uh, post translocation monitoring. Uh, so that's what you are seeing here on this image. So this here, we were monitoring some giraffe to look at whether giraffe will be able to cross actually uh, River Nile and Lake Albert. And so this is because you had moved some giraffe to the southern portion of the, of the river. Uh, and so there are some giraffe also that had tags here. So that's here, this individual number 15. So we're trying to see whether that river will be an effective barrier, and it was. And so this can help you see where the giraffe are going, which habitat they are using, and things like that. 
Uh, and so that also ties into the habitat use metrics. You want to know where the animals are going, where are they, where are they, which type of habitat do they prefer, especially in large landscapes where there is a lot, a lot of uh, threats going on. Uh, like here in Machison Falls National Park, uh, this park has um, about 80% of the world's Nubian giraffe, but then it also holds about three quarters of Uganda's oil deposits. So obviously oil is a much more valuable resource in terms of economic development. And there's already started have, uh, there's already oil development going on here. So you need, we need this type of data to monitor where giraffe are going and which type of landscape will be uh, more affected if, the, if in case anything happened. So obviously for us, we are thinking long-term. So in terms of uh, research that can inform management, so we've deployed these scholars across various countries, but also to study uh, various uh, aspects of giraffe conservation. So for instance, uh, in Northwestern Namibia, we, we are very interested in looking at movement and uh, thermal regulation of giraffe. And that's like in these landscapes where you have giraffe in very high temperatures. We don't know where they go. We don't know how they get resources. So it's quite an interesting study to see you know, like just to answer some of the simplest questions that people ask, like what's the home range of giraffe? And that can vary a lot. So in northern, in northwestern Namibia, they cover more than 2000 square kilometers. So if you are talking now to government and asking if they ask you what's the home range of giraffe, well, it can vary from country to country. So for Namibia, they cover more than 2000 square kilometers, but you come to other countries where it's much greener, where they have their resources, then that home range decreases significantly. Uh, so that's like the case, like in Chad, uh, where there is seasonal flooding. And so we asked ourselves, where do giraffe go when actually the park where they are keeps on flooding and also there's conflict with humans. And so that's one of the things that we use this uh, technology for. And so for that, you can see how giraffe are using uh, the different habitats through the different seasons. Uh, in Kenya, our key interest is looking at the impacts of infrastructure. Uh, in December, we call a giraffe in Athika Piti. Uh, there is an area where there is a lot of roadkill. Uh, so over an 11 kilometer stretch of road, uh, more than 124 animals were killed, of which 10 were giraffe. Uh, just last year, in one year, you can imagine if you're having 124 animals being killed just by vehicle collisions, that's quite a big number. And so you need to see where do animals cross most often and where can we actually have a tangible impact? Because obviously, if there is a major road going through an important ecosystem for wildlife, then that's really hard to, to inform the government to make changes unless you have a uh, fine scale, hardcore data that you can present. And that's what we are doing here. So in Tanzania, uh, we, we tagged some giraffe three years ago to monitor uh, the impacts of giraffe skin disease. Our interest here was looking at whether uh, the disease affects, uh, significantly affects. So that's what I briefly talked about from what we saw, uh, individuals with severe giraffe skin disease seem to not be greatly affected as, uh, well, with severe skin disease, sorry, are more affected than the ones that do not have uh, the severe forms of the disease. Uh, in Uganda, we are trying to understand, uh, obviously, Particularly, we are interested in looking at the differences of movement between male and female giraffe. So when it comes to giraffe, uh, female, uh, female giraffe move much more often between the same area, but male giraffe move further. So that's an interesting aspect to look at because if you are interested in conserving land for animals, then it will be good to know you know, to, to what extent do these male giraffe move? Because obviously if you are, if you have a small park and you have giraffe that are moving quite far, then you need to think of different management strategies. Uh, then in Mozambique, we have a very large translocation effort going on. Uh, the government of Mozambique uh, intends to move about uh, 300 odd giraffe thereabout. And so obviously if they're moving 300 giraffe, then you need to monitor them and see how they are adapting to the to the new areas. And so these are giraffe that are being reintroduced to the country after disappearing uh, more than 50 years ago. So you can understand this is a very, very exciting time. Uh, and the idea here is that the giraffes will boost uh, tourism. And so if you bring in these animals, then you need to be sure that you can keep an eye on them. 
So all in all, uh, the trigger, the through the Trigger Tracker Initiative, uh, we've deployed uh, more than 330 units. Uh, we've had uh, almost 2 million data points across Africa. And we've tagged all the different four species of giraffes. So we are we can we can be able to tell if there are any uh, interesting differences between the different species in terms of movement. Uh, what we've seen mostly we feel is dependent on uh, on actually on the locations. Uh, and also we've used these tags in 14 different African countries, and we've put, produced more than 12 publications in terms of research output. And we have many more in preparation. And so. In short, uh, that's what we are doing with uh, uh, with uh, with tracking technology to monitor giraffe. And I hope you've all learned something. Uh, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Arthur, for the presentation. So that was amazing. And um, we'll move on to the q and session, we have a few questions. So the first one would be a general question to just um, uh, start off the q and bit. So um, what's the next big challenge to solve in the field? So to solve on remotely tracking giraffe movement? Uh -huh. uh, that's a very interesting one. Um, I mean, one of the biggest challenge is uh, actually getting, uh, having like good uh, data over a long period of time. So the different units have also different uh, lifespans. That's maybe something that I should have covered. So the Savannah tracking have solar panels. Ideally, they can go for three to four years worth of data. Uh, anyone who've worked with color data understands that actually that's quite really cool. So we've had that happen, but then also we've had units fail and that's a big challenge. So if you have units set out and you want them to fail and, and they fail, then you have useless data that you can't really make use of. So these are this is one of the challenge where we are looking for a lot of innovation. Uh, Savannah Tracking have done a good job in terms of adapting the units, looking at the different tools that how the different units can be used. So like the, un, the OC units, they repurpose them to use them on the tail and that did not affect even the transmission and the collection of the data. So that is one of those challenges that is always there that that's evolving, that at least we are trying to stay ahead of. Um, and so that's mostly impacted also by the availability of chips. Uh, I believe right now the, the supply chain issues that happened within the last two years also affected that. Uh, but at least so far things are starting to get back to normal for a, a bit. But in short, I think, yeah, that's one of the biggest ones. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Jaco had a question about the lifespan, which you have mentioned. Jaco, would you like to add um, the next bit of your question? Nettie, do you want to read it out? Jack has had to, uh, he's on the move, so he's not able oh, to okay. um, jump in. Okay, okay, that's yeah. fine. So he's curious to know the retention rate of the units, the series and the savannah tracking units on the animal and the wear and tear of the units. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, Yako, for the question. Um, yeah, so for the for the savannah tracking, I think I've covered that. For the series tags, um, I believe they are also solar power um and they can also go for very long we've only started testing them in the last two years they seem to be working well so because they are solar powered they they also retain the charge very well um the only challenge again as i mentioned you need we, when you are designing your study you need to think of what type of data do you need so if you need the fine scale data the better off going with the savannah tracking units but if you are looking for data that is just looking at the basic movement, then the series tag can get the job done. But then you will need to understand that they are just collecting points every four hours. And that is uh, a, a lot of time. And so that cannot inform a lot in terms of movement ecology. Uh, but then the Savannah tracking, you can program it depending on how you want with the understanding that if you want very fine scale data, like collecting points every 12 minutes, then it's going to quickly drain your battery if you are in an area where there is not a lot of sun. Uh, so that can happen in Nairobi where it tends to be cloudy for a lot of times in the in the year. But if you're in areas where there's a lot of sun, then yeah, 
Yeah, you can crank it up and see what comes out of the, the data. Uh, cool. So we also had a few questions on uh, the long-term impacts of the GPS tag. So have you done any research to see whether they have an impact on the animal or what impacts they have? Uh, we have not done any research, but we, we do have some observations, if I can put it like that. Mm -hmm. um, so what we've seen is that the earlier units, of course, this has been adapting because they, they have some impacts. So like the very first one, which was just a, an elephant collar that was modified to go on a giraffe. Obviously, that one, because of the friction on the skin, it, it would cause the fraying of the it, could, it, it was causing some fraying of the skin. So obviously we moved away from that and that also was not staying on. Uh, the head harness, that one was also causing some issues uh, because it was in near an area where there was a lot of movement. So it was uh, affecting the movement of the jaw and then it was causing also some fraying on the skin. And so when we observed such things, we obviously move away from that because then the health of the animal is obviously uh, paramount. We don't just put out collars because we're doing it for the sake of it. We also need to take into account the health of the animal. And so that's why I mentioned that once a giraffe is darted and it's on the ground, we need to quickly reverse the, the drugs because the giraffes have a very unique uh, physiology. Uh, for the others, uh, for the OC unit, the tail units, we have not seen any impacts. Uh, even when we've removed the OC units from the OCCON, we saw actually that the the bone is just hollow, no infection, because there's not a lot of blood vessels there. Uh, and even after a while, once the OC unit has fallen off and uh, the holes there, they, they, they close. So there's really hasn't been any impact on the health of giraffe with the, whatever unit that we've been using so far, ex except for the earlier, earlier designs, the new ones are, are very, very safe. Okay, great, thank you. Um... Steph, do you want to jump in? Yes, I do. I've got questions. Um, yeah. Arthur, I loved that talk so much. I did not know how little I knew about giraffes. So um, what, that was just such a delight. I'm curious. Um, I loved how you walked us through all of the types of designs that you went through to um, the attachment designs and then the, the different data that allowed you to, to have. I'd love to hear more about what your process is can I ask, there's a couple of parts to my question. One, it sounds like you're uh, taking off the shelf solutions and then trying them out and adapting them. Is mm -hmm. Or is it more of a collaborative uh, relationship with the tag companies? Are you working with them directly or are you just seeing what's out there and just like trying to adapt it to your to your uses? Um, simply put, I guess maybe it's a bit of both. Yeah. Um, so like Savannah tracking, they are well known here in, in Kenya. Yeah, yeah. They've made many of the tags that people use. So when we approach them thinking of, hey, is it possible to fit a unit on the Osikon of a giraffe? That was just one of the work ideas we had. And luckily, because Savannah Tracking are also uh, like, they're also eccentric in that way that they'd be interested to try those things. Totally. And so we try them, we see what works. Um, and then we come up with a solution. And even those same OC units that were designed for the OCCON, they have evolved, we've put them on the tail. And now that same OC unit is now also being adapted to be used on vultures. So yeah. now, because of that evolving of discussions and working with them closely, that has worked really well. Uh, on the other hand, yeah, we look at what's out there. So that was the case with series tags. Those were yeah. designed specifically for cattle. We say, hey, a cow has ears, a giraffe also has ears. Why not try to put it there and see what type of data we get? And so we are always interested in trying to move the envelope because there is a lot that we don't know about giraffe. And mm. we, we'd we want to be on the cusp of figuring out all of this information and see how it can help inform management. And so we've tried both approaches where come up with ideas or we see what else, what's, what's out there. I was curious to... The second part of my question was, as you're working mm -hmm. with other sectors, what's your advice for, because it, sometimes it's like you're speaking in different languages, right? What's been your experience yeah. like building collaborations across across sectors successfully and, and getting to the point where you're getting really good tools that, that, are, that are useful? Uh, 
yeah Sorry. i mean that's spot. yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, th that's a that's a very hard question uh, but i think uh, to answer to answer it i would say you need to show uh, number one you i mean we have the passion for it so we'd yeah. like to see ourselves as the voice for giraffe so we are really insistent and in, in saying that we think this is important and we think we should go for it and this is what we'll get out of it uh, and so again i'll come back to that point of for, when it comes to giraffe there is still a lot that we don't know and we'd want to to be like the voice for giraffe and say if we know this information then it can help inform this and this and this uh, obviously for giraffe there is that challenge of getting everyone on the table because in east africa the reality is that people mostly care about lion elephant rhino so for us we are in this space where we want giraffe to be also on that very same profile and we leverage our network of collaborators. So as again, you've seen that we, we've worked with the Savannah Tracking Series. When it comes to the outputs of the data, we'd work with the Smithsonian Conservation Institute, San Diego Zoo Global. So we have all these partners that also think the same way that we do. And we bring those types of ideas to then to governments and other stakeholders and say, hey, it's not just us crazy folks thinking about giraffe. It matters to all these other people, and this is what we can do when we work together and just try to bring as many people as we can to the table to get these data and uh, make use of them uh, for management. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Arthur. Thanks, Nettie. Thank you. Uh, Jake, do you want to jump in? Hello, yes. Um, I was just curious about, uh, you mentioned that um, Giraffes in drier areas have bigger ranges and everything. I was wondering if you would, you might have already mentioned it, but if climate change, if, if I don't know if the region's getting drier, if you would expect their ranges to get bigger and bigger, uh, if the region is getting drier, I just wondered. Uh, thanks, Jake. Um, so this is something that we still don't know a lot about. Um, and that's because giraffe, for the most part, are uh, water independent species. But then with, with climate change, yeah, obviously that can change. Uh, we are seeing longer dry seasons here in Kenya. Uh, so that can happen. Uh, so I've just returned from Namibia where we met with some researchers who are looking at climate change and the impacts of, uh, the impacts of climate change on various species. And so we were working with them to see if then giraffe can be one of those species that they can model and look at the types of impacts that climate change will have on giraffe habitat, because that's, maybe how we'd look at it, not really on giraffe themselves, but on their habitat, because then what influences the movement of giraffe and other species for the most part is looking for conspecifics and also looking for resources. And so if then these animals are being forced to move to longer distances in search of resources, then obviously this is something that we'd be interested in looking at. Uh, when it comes to giraffe specifically, yeah, we know that there were some photos that came out of Kenya of giraffe dying in uh, in uh, of giraffe dying from drought but that's still something that remains to be uh, i want to say maybe uh, fully proven i guess because giraffe they do they can withstand long periods uh, well not they can withstand going without water for a number of days uh, they can stand better rather than compared to the other animals so even now chatting with people who are in samburu which is in northern kenya which is dry they are seeing more giraffes come to the park where rivers have dried up, but giraffes are there. They are getting water from the plants. But then other animals that are dependent on water, like elephants, have moved out in search of water. So really, it's still an interesting question, but we don't have like the, uh, the best data to answer that question. Maybe we'll know in a few years, but there are ways to get to the answer to that question. Just maybe not now. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Friend, do you want to jump in and ask your question? Sure. <clears throat> so, Arthur, I appreciate your uh, presentation there. It was uh, pretty informative. And <clears throat> I guess basically from a research standpoint, uh, I'm curious, given the challenges in capturing the draft, are you able to, to tag or, or put monitors on very many of them when you're either doing a project or evaluating the different types of monitors? Uh, thank you, Brent, for the question. Uh, 
I guess maybe one thing that I didn't mention uh, during my presentation is the cost of the unit. Uh, in an ideal world, yeah, we'd want to catch as many as we want, put tags on every giraffe, but obviously there is the financial implications. Uh, so the average satellite tag of a giraffe costs about uh, 2,000 US dollars, including the fees for transmission. So obviously fitting a, a, a satellite tag on a giraffe is quite an expensive endeavor. So if you take the tag and you, you account for the drugs, you account for the fuel, you account for the salaries of the vets and the capturing team, all of that, we'd be looking at about four to 5,000 US dollars, quite expensive. If you're talking about the, uh, the satellite tags. Uh, for the series tags, which are much more GSM, maybe that will be cheaper because you, you're just using an applicator and then, but they don't have the satellite capability. With that being said, uh, we work, I, well, at least for East Africa, we work in areas where we also need to submit proposals to the government and these governments, they need to review the, the, like the, 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 the research reasoning behind why we are tagging. So not just, even if it's for management, we need to show that research uh, justification. And so they'd like to, uh, they like to look at that and say, okay, why are we sampling X number of animals and uh, instead of Y number of animals? So we'd like, they prefer to keep that number small so we've often done that. And in, in cases where we've had uh, like many tags available to us, we also try to distribute them just so to see the differences of movement of these animals because we work in very large landscapes and you'd like to see how, uh, how these different animals are moving. So we've, we've taken that approach or we've also, thinking of, we've also been thinking of putting the tags in one area and then just see how far the animals move. So really, to simply answer your question, that mostly depends on the availability of funds and also what the government can reasonably allow. So they cannot, for instance, allow us to put 100 units in one area where they'd feel more comfortable like doing like 20 or something like that. So we try to work within the legal framework, but also being driven by the amount of resources that we have at hand. Have you by any chance uh, looked at potential partnering with any of the satellite companies or uh, the tag manufacturers? And of course, there's, uh, I mean, I've, I've looked at wearables for animals and there's probably 60 to 80 companies out there today, but uh, there's a small number of satellite uh, providers out there uh, and some of whom I've had contact with. And I've never brought this question up, but I'm just curious if, if that's an option for you all. Oh, that, that's interesting. Uh, I mean, yeah, if you have interesting contacts, yeah, we'd, we'd love to chat and see what comes out of it. Um, at the moment, uh, we do have, uh, through our collaborations with some of our partners, we do have some, uh, I'd say maybe discounts from Iridium, uh, because then we, we, get, uh, we get good rates in terms of the transmission costs. But if there are other options, we'd be interested in looking at that. Uh, sorry, uh, in terms of manufacturers of, uh, of units, uh, it, it will de some don't have the units that we need, for instance, to track a giraffe. And that's usually the problem there. Like uh, African wildlife tracking, uh, in the beginning, because we were simply modifying what they already had in hand, it was easier for them to work with us and, you know, design units that we could use. But then as time went by, yeah, when we proposed the new ideas of, of what they could design and, you know, give us to put on giraffe, the the interest sort of waned off. And that's a reality that we, 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 we accept that for some of these companies, they are looking at the profit margins, but for us, we are more interested in the science. And so if you can help bridge that gap, hey, I'd be interested to chat and see what comes out of it. But there are also some realities that we must accept. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Arthur. Um, you've also touched on a question that we had like on the amount of money the satellite, the GPS tags cost. So I think you've touched on that. Um, Robin, do you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Arthur, for that great talk. It was really interesting to see um, how these new uh, telemetry units work in the wild, basically. <laughs> 
so in reality, because uh, on paper, they always look good. And then in reality, maybe then satellite connection is not that good and so on. And this is really valuable to, to, uh, to hear about that. And um, also connected to this, um, my question was whether you checked like open collar or smart parks with the LoRa LoRaWAN uh, transmission systems, or whether this is because of the large range ranges of the giraffe more difficult because you would have to build up a LoRaWAN network, or do you have any experience with that? And um, yeah, that would be my first question. Oh, okay, uh, thanks for the question robin um, well uh, we we have worked with uh, african wildlife tracking i believe they are trying to design a new units where we can we can sh we, we can uh, at least try the lora network so we do have that one being trialed uh, so it's being trialed in malawi uh, so it's still like on the that's something that we're still uh, learning more about uh, we haven't heard uh, well, we haven't had uh, many challenges so far because it's still very new, but once we know, we'll see what comes out of it. Um, yeah, and I'm just seeing here from the comments here that we've also had discussions with smart parks, but yeah, nothing has come out, nothing has come out of it to date. So again, as I mentioned, for us, we, are, we want to be the voice for giraffe, but then obviously there's always that big challenge of getting everyone on the table. We have all these ideas, we want to do it, but the bigger challenge is always getting all those people uh, invested and involved in doing such important work. Sure. Uh, second thing that uh, I found interesting that you were talking about that your government was uh, more or less uh, limiting the number of animals yet that you might um, be able to to uh, collar or uh, tag. Uh, over here, it's the other way around, basically, because they say from a scientific standpoint, uh, only to have maybe 10 animals on a track, it uh, doesn't give you that uh, amount of scientific input than having 100 or 200, you know. The sample size, the statistics are relevant when you have a large number of animals in a, in a certain area and not distributed or everywhere. It's more like a scientific versus management approach. Like scientifically, you want to have a lot of animals and a lot of tags and lots of statistical power. And then from a management spend standpoint, you maybe want to distribute that all, all over the place. It's quite interesting to see the differences there. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I just want to make some clarification. I mean, there is no standard approach to this. It just depends on how you present your case. So you might be in a position where they say, yeah, let's put on as many as we can. But also they are, all, they are also cognizant on, uh, on, on being reasonable on the number of units that can be used. Um, and this is because also, at least for the most part in East Africa, how the government works, it's that here you have, like, I cannot go out and dart an animal. That needs to be a government vet that does that. They are the ones that also account for the drugs uh, and the roping teams and all of that. So they, they are thinking along those lines and there are things that they take into consideration that I may not. But it's not like a given that they will obviously limit the number of units you can put out. It's just all depends on how you can, how you present your case, I guess. I see, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Arthur. So the last uh, question would be from Consolata. Uh, Consolata, do you want to jump in? Yes, hi, Arthur. Hi, I have a, I have a question on the permits. Other than the research permits, which other permits are required for tagging? And is it a challenge to get the permit, especially in Kenya? <laughs> uh, thanks, Consolata. Uh, yes, uh, Kenya, well, right now it's, let me just speak for now, it's incredibly difficult to get those permits, uh, but that's because right now the two institutions, there's KWS and WRTI are being split, so that has affected the process. But to put it simply, uh, the permit that you would need uh, is if you have your research permit, you then need to apply for what is known as uh, uh, an, uh, an immobilization permit. So that's what you need from the from KWS. That's the Kenya Wildlife Service. That's the the government authority that will issue that. And then once they issue the permit, they then assign you a vet to work with. 
and then once you have your vet you agree on the on the dates but then when i say that in between getting your research permit and getting your immobilization permit there is a whole process in between that is incredibly challenging uh, because you need to get your prior informed consent document pic i'm sure I, some of you who've worked in Kenya have gone through that process. And that one is difficult because depending on where you are working, you need to involve as many stakeholders. So meaning like the community, the communities, uh, the local communities, the private landowners, county governments, the different research institutions that might be based there, all these people need to be informed and aware of the work that you are doing. And so the moment you mention tagging and immobilization in your proposal, then you are also required to do to get your uh, MAT, uh, MAT and MOA. And that's another whole separate process before they can even issue your research permit. But once you have that, then you can get your immobilization permit, uh, which is uh, should be straightforward, but that's always easier said than done. Uh, but once you have that, then the government will help you through that process in making sure that things are going well. Uh, what we've found uh, that has helped us is to make sure that your research questions are based on a need for, well, are, are based on something that can help inform management of these wildlife. So that has helped us quite a lot. And I would encourage people who are thinking of doing any tagging here in Kenya to frame their questions around wildlife management. Thank you, Arthur. So to close uh, the session, just a blue sky uh, question that you have. Um, where do you see this going in the near future? And is there anything that makes you hopeful or optimistic? Oh, uh, that's, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. Um, so we, where I see this going is, I mean, for me in an ideal world, I want to see the, all these data that we are collecting, we obviously share it openly with the government. Uh, so the government visualizes the data through ArthRanger and we provide them access to view the data and make use of it. In an ideal world, we want all these data that we are collecting to help governments then respond to these emerging issues. And that's where we want to see. We want it to be very, to be much more open, much more collaborative, so such that we are not just doing it for the for the hell of it, but rather working with the government to better protect giraffe. That's what we want. Uh, and what's giving me hope is that we've seen at least uh, some of this work that we are doing, we've seen those tangible fruits, uh, like what I showed in terms of uh, giraffe, mo giraffe moving across the River Nile, or maybe giraffe moving in areas outside of protected areas. So like we have a cool photo that I didn't show where there were giraffe in Gambela National Park in Ethiopia, where giraffe were going outside of the protected area. And so this then informed the government of where to increase uh, surveillance and where to increase patrol effort. So these are just those small steps where we are getting this really cool and important data that is then helping uh, government respond to these emergencies. So for us, that's always very, very cool. And it gives me hope because as I said, we are learning quite a lot uh, when it comes to giraffe because we know very little and so we are it's now the right time to study giraffe and collect as much data as possible that can be used to make these decisions for for the future and for protecting uh, giraffe for posterity thank you so much that was a great uh, answer um so i'm aware we are on the hour so we'll close off but you can hang and ask any questions you have afterwards. So just to close the session, uh, thank you so much, Arthur, for the presentation. And thank you everyone for joining us today and for making the session lively. Uh, the recording for this session will be shared in a few days and you'll be able to access it on Ylabs and our YouTube channel. Our, our next tutorial will be on the 16th of February. Um, so, Stephanie has shared the link in the chat and um, will be joined by Kennedy Murivi from Opajeta Conservancy, who will take us through a tutorial on how to set up camera traps to monitor wildlife. Um, you can register using the link that has been shared and um, drop any questions you have during registration. 
Thank you once again. Um, have a lovely day and the rest of your week. I hope to see you in our next tutorial. All right. Thanks, everyone, for your time.